So hi, and welcome to what is now episode three of uh, Who's Zooming Who? Uh, three is the magic number, I guess. Uh, and with me this week is Dr. Orna Farrell from DCU, um, who recently uh, ran a fantastically successful online course, um, Open Teach. She's going to talk to us a little bit about that uh, and perhaps uh, just give some reflections on this whole uh, pivot to online teaching. Not that Orna is a stranger to online teaching in that she is the chair um, of the undergraduate programs in DCU Connected. Uh, I think I've got that right. But look, enough from me. Orna, thank you very much for joining us. Perhaps you'd like to give us a, a brief introduction and um, let us know what you'd like to talk about. Thanks, Ken. Lovely introduction. Uh, chair of Humanities Programs. Yes. Uh, small correction. Uh, so thanks for asking me to do Who's Zooming Who. I enjoyed the first episode immensely. Um, you pretty much covered the main points about me. I'm a program chair in DCU, an assistant professor, and my uh, area is online education. I'm particularly interested in uh, professional development, uh, teaching online, and e-portfolios, I suppose, is one of my big areas of, of interest and research. Very good. Uh, so as you mentioned, yeah, we had a, a, a recent online course, Open Teach, which comes from a forum, national forum funded project uh, aimed at providing professional development for open online educators, particularly part-time educators. Uh, and the course is kind of the end of the project. It was the main deliverable. And the idea for the whole project came from the fact that we have a very large cohort of part-time online educators working with us in DCU Connected and how could we create PD that would be flexible to suit them maybe holding down a full-time job and teaching at the same time accessible so it wasn't centered around a campus based program um, and also um, tailored to suit their particular needs because a lot of PD uh, in this area focuses on campus-based lectures, um, maybe doing a little bit of online. Uh, and our, our emphasis was on fully online uh, and flexible. And also one of the big things out of the literature on PD for this cohort is being an online student yourself. Sure. So experiencing the other, the other you know, the, the student, student experience itself. Yeah, absolutely. Look, and, and, and I suppose um, for, for some people who know me or some people who listen to me for any length of time, um, my experience is certainly more as a student than it ever was as an educator. And um, there was a time there where I had this MOOC addiction. It's cured now. So um, if you do enough of them and, and don't complete them, you eventually get over it. Um, but learning online is very much different um, to learning in a face-to-face -face classroom environment. Just touching on that uh, briefly, because I know at the recent um, World Conference on Online Learning, you, you launched your literature review of teaching online is different. Uh, perhaps maybe you could, uh, and, and that was a forerunner to the, or part of the Open Teach project as well, I think, if I'm, if I'm right. Yeah. Um, so, so perhaps maybe you could talk us through uh, a little bit of that. Sure, Ken. So I suppose the project had a couple of phases, and the, uh, the first phase was um, a needs analysis. So we did focus groups and a questionnaire with both our online students and our online staff and we asked them you know what makes effective online teaching um, so we created a report of that and then the next thing we did was a, a very big literature review focusing on teaching online the issues of part-time pd uh, and effective professional development for online teachers as well. So we kind of focused on those four, three areas uh, and it's on our website, as is the needs analysis report, openteach.ie, if anyone wants to read. It was received very well at that uh, World Conference. We were kind of shocked by how interested people were. We were kind of piggybacking on, on the fact that we had like a large number of online education people in one area and that we'd launched the report there um but but yeah people were really interested mary mitchell o'connor the minister for higher education actually mentioned it in her speech and the paper copies that i had produced i think i got 500 printed they were gone 
Excellent. People were coming up to me asking me, have you got a paper copy? Yeah, I, th- um, I, I think you gave me the last one, or at least that's what you said to me at the time. I felt very special. Um, yeah. I'm only sorry I didn't get his autograph now. Um, I know, I know. It would be worth so much more. So you said, you're telling me that these are in high demand, I could make money they on They were, them? they were very high. Not, I'm not sure what the demand is like now. Um, so Katrina Niche, who's who we, we um, hired as the Open Teach Learning Designer, led that uh, literature review process uh, and, and did a really comprehensive job as well. And, and the, the, the title of it was Teaching Online is Different. So what were the chief differences you found from people that were... Um, and, and look, I guess the entire... Uh, every teacher in the world is finding out what's different now because they're all having to do some, some element of teaching online. But um, maybe you predicted all this happening. I don't know. Um, what, what were the chief differences you found at the time or what were the kind of things that, that, that stood out um, as being different? Okay, um, so I suppose we didn't go a kind of comparative approach. We didn't say, you know, this is teaching online, this is face-to-face sure. teaching. Um, but, the, you know, from the literature, there are some really key differences. One of, the, one of them is the importance of uh, community and presence in teaching online. The reason for that is because people can feel very isolated. And if they feel isolated, they're more inclined to drop out of a course. Sure. So a way of counteracting that is kind of creating this learning of commu- learning community based on the garrison uh, community of uh, practice kind of idea. And then it, a kind of a, an extension of that is this whole idea of presence. So you've got teacher presence. So, you know, ways of making students feel like the teacher is there for them. Uh, and is a person and humanizing the experience. So, you know, things you can do are like short videos, photos, uh, telling students, you know, a lot about yourself, uh, encouraging them to do the same. So, you know, kind of building up that community. Uh, and then also you have um, obviously the presence of the students themselves. So trying to encourage them to do the same and form community as well, whether that be a formal one within the course or an informal one. Students often have informal ones in WhatsApp groups and little study groups and encouraging them to do that and, 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 and actually telling them the reasons why, you know, you, will, you may feel very isolated. These are some of the things we can work together to help you with that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I know in my own experience, I suppose, both as, a, a, as an online um, educator and as an online student, a lot of the things you probably just take for granted in a typical formal classroom situation, you have to much more deliberately uh, uh, do. Um, so a lot of those kind of things, like telling people about yourself in, in, a, in a, I suppose, a, a traditional face-to-face classroom, that kind of stuff just happens in, in what seems to be a very natural sort of uh, part of the, 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 the sort of interaction between, between people. Whereas in an online environment, you, you need to be a bit more deliberate about it um, and, 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 and incorporate it as part of the design. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing you, you said there, which is really interesting about the students, um, because I know in, in one of the online courses I did, that was a, a proper taught uh, master's program. Um, the really good thing for me was I had one other guy who was doing the course at the same time as myself, and we became... Um, good friends for the duration of the program at any rate um, and just to be able to have him to, to contact him either by email or by, by by phone and say we've been asked this question what, what do you think it was uh, that we're being asked to do and, and and vice versa and that's the kind of stuff that again I suppose in a traditional face-to-face classroom just happens because you, you know you're you're talking over coffee with the with the person sitting alongside you but of course in an online environment, there is no um, canteen um, that you go to between classes, or there's uh, you, you don't have those kind of um, those minutes of waiting for a lecture to walk in the door where you can um, shoot the breeze. So they have to be sort of more deliberately brought into uh, mm-hmm. brought into the design. So yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting to, to 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 hear that the that the that the um, literature and the research back backs that up. Moving on, I suppose, to the Open Teach course, which is just, just I think it's just finished. Am I right in saying that? About a week, yeah. About a week, okay. And it was a three-week course? or It was a two-week course, but two-week we course. did kind of leave it open a little longer because a sure. few people were, were asked for a bit more time to finish. Yes, and of course, you started this literally um, right at the time that, that suddenly every uh, 
every every school, college, or university in the world became online. Um, yeah, so we had a registration open, and and that's the thing we we the, we we opened the course up to anyone. So we 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 did build it with our own staff in mind, uh, but we made it in such a way that we hoped could could help others as well. And we'd we'd open up the registration to anyone who wanted to from any sector, and we, we had about a hundred and fifty registrants about two weeks before the courses to begin, and we were re really happy with that. We thought, wow, that's great, good good numbers and then uh, the coronavirus and the closing of universities and sending everyone home happened and uh, I, I think I looked at the forum one day and it had climbed 300 participants wow. uh, and then at 450 I had to close it because um, I needed a few days because I had to manually set up people on Moodle all the sure. external people I had to get accounts created and enroll them. And then I had to figure out how to send a mass Google email, which I, I'm quite pleased I figured that out. I use this thing called GMAS and sent mm -hmm. out an email. Uh, but I think there's about 500 more people on a waiting list to do the wow. second one. And that's unadvertised. Yeah. And, like and I haven't it, promoted it. And it is going to run a second time. The plan is probably to run it in the summer, yeah. Okay. Um, right. We have to, I suppose we're trying to close out the kind of current run we uh, sure. mark the assessments and tidy up after the first run and then we'll turn our attention to it but yeah i mean i think we may run it again uh, in the summer and just the, the course itself now i have to admit uh, and i think um this says more about me than it would ever say about your your, your course I, I i'm terrible for for being very enthusiastic about starting things i'm a great starter i'm just a very poor finisher um and you probably even find that with most of the questions I ask. The, 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 the questions start off sounding really interesting, and by the time I get to the punchline, it's, 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 it's gone. So to, r running through the actual structure of the course, it's very short, two weeks. Um, so what, what, what did people, what, what were the kind of things people did in those two weeks, and what was the, okay. the, 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 the structure of it? So we followed the ABC learning design approach, and we in a, in December we did one of the ABC learning design workshops facilitated by Claire Gormley, who's a DCU staff member involved in in a big ABC uh, European project. Brilliant. So she facilitated a really good workshop for us, and we came up with a with a course design. It's two hours actually, and mapped it all out. And our our kind of key things are it has to be short, because our target audience does not have a lot of time sure it has to be flexible in terms of when you can engage how you can engage where you're located and it has to hit on the key points of teaching online but without straying down to, into too much content um, and also we kind of made takeaway resources that someone could download take away and maybe look at later as well so we kind of were trying to make engagement times very flexible make the resources creative commons licensed and um something that people could refer to quickly and easily later on and we we adopted a scenario based learning approach which is a bit like problem based learning so instead of kind of we were kind of thinking this audience how to pitch it you know you don't want to be that this is how you should do it sure uh, because you're talking to professionals, you're talking about people who could have lots of experience, maybe in their discipline or lots of experience teaching online and they could just be interested. You know, the profile was so varied as well. Um, so we didn't want to be that kind of sage on the stage. This is what you should do. And if you're not doing that, you're doing it wrong. Sure. So we were, we were trying to think of a creative way around that. So we came up with this scenario idea. And we created three online teaching scenarios based on real world, our, our real world experience. And we created personas for each of those online educators used in the scenarios. Um, so we have Emer, Michal and Anya. And um, Katrina created personas based on talking. So she gathered the information from staff uh, and also the focus groups we did early on and created those profiles. And actually, I think they're kind of startlingly accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so then we went about creating the scenarios, scripting, thinking about the problem, trying to make sure the problem wasn't too easy uh, sure. and the, the answer was not too, you know, too obvious. Uh, and Emer's one, 
was was a little easy, but we thought that was a nice way of inducting sure. people into this kind of way, uh, approach. So there was a lot of background mapping out of, you know, here are the kind of prompt questions people need to answer. Uh, and we were also trying to propose questions in a way that would stimulate conversation and debate. Mm. Um, we then created the animated scenarios on video scribe, okay. which again was great crack. I, 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 I loved making videos and stuff, but it took, it took a while to get me up to speed on video scribe. Um, and Katrina as well, storyboarded everything out beforehand. Very good. Um, so we were very orchestrated and planned and yeah. things took a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, oh, I mean, we spent about five, four, four or five months making it. Well, for, for, a, for a two week course. Yeah, I mean, incredible. Um, and it does. I mean, look, as I said, I did dip in um, and was really, really impressed um, with the first day and some of the, the, the early materials. Um, I think I, I did see the Emer scenario. Uh, and I think I said it at the time, but well, she related to you because she sounds remarkably like you. Um, That's me, the voiceover, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but no, and, and it, it was very um, obvious to see um, the, the time and effort that had, had gone into it. And I guess, again, that's, part of coming back to the, the online um being that bit different from face to face that because your materials and your teaching materials need to be that bit more deliberate and considered and taught out that's an investment um and you know anybody who who approaches this approaches online learning is this is a way of saving time um they probably need to get that idea out of their head um uh, it might save time later ken that's the thing pos yeah possibly it, yeah yeah the and you the second and second or third time you do it you might tweak things a little bit like you might get a few pieces of sure. feedback yeah. you know you might notice something mm, that could have been a bit better or that sure. didn't work and you might spend a bit of time tweaking it but but actually the the reproduce you, like you could you can probably reuse content for about two or three years sure. with small tweaks yeah. before it's out of date so the although there's huge upfront investment there is payoff later the actual sure. yeah no, know, that, during that, the that, year activity a lot of it is less yeah that and, and that's, that that yeah absolutely it's a, it, that's a very very good point and a point well made so you had um if i can get the numbers right about 450 start with the course um mm -hmm. And I'm guessing, given the, the, the worldwide nature of the coronavirus uh, shutdown, they were from all over. Uh, yeah, it, it turned out to be a more kind of varied cohort than we'd expected. So we had a lot of higher red people, which, again, which was kind of who, who we had in mind uh, and people involved in teaching online and blended. And uh, so we've good good group from Ireland and, and, you know, from the universities and from the institutes of technology, like, well, I think we we had probably someone from nearly every one. Wow. And then we had, yeah, some kind of varied international participants. You know, we had, we had either, uh, we, like, we, we had a, like a, a smattering of different international people, which was, which was cool. A few Canadians, a few Americans, a few Europeans. Um, and then we had a large cohort from further ed, which again, okay. we hadn't expected. Uh, very large. Um, and they ha they had, gosh, a whole different parcel of issues, which which I found very interesting. And then we had, I think we may have had one or two second level teachers as well. Okay. So nice diversity, which I think made for very interesting discussions, and okay. added to the experience for for everyone. I think. And and you mentioned at the start that all of these resources live on the Open Teach. Dot IE website now, mm -hmm. um, and and the course will be running again at some stage. Yeah, and also the if people can have a copy of the course if they want. I have yet to add that to the website, but it's a Moodle-based course. Um, so you know anyone who would like a copy can request a copy. I have to set up the, uh, a tab on the website and, and a forum, but that's that's certainly the plan. And also, I'm looking at at the moment uh, creating an open textbook out of the entire course. Oh, very good. So that's that's I've been. So so you're you're still busy. It's it's, it's far from done. Then is is what you're saying. Is what you're saying to us. Well, I have to. I have a few things that reporting things to do for the national forum. I have to write okay. a few reports, which I should be doing. But instead, I was playing around with press books. Yes, and, 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 and talking my to go into that and talking to you. Um, but I'd like to 
I very like we're very committed to the whole openness thing. So you know, any of the resources people can reuse, remix, very welcome to. You know, same with the course. And I like the idea of making the the open textbook as well because I think it kind of has longer lasting impact. Sure. Um, and you know, it's like a tangible artifact from the project yeah. as well. Then, ab- ab- absolutely. And look, uh, you know, you, you obviously, and it was clear for me, as I said, from from the from the bit I had checked out. Um, that there was a lot of work, um, and you've just outlined some of the, some of the, some of the approach that you took to that. But it was obvious um, that there was a lot of work we got into it, and and it would be great, um, obviously fantastic to see it live on in as many formats as, as as possible. Just just moving on slightly from that, I mean, you know, teaching online isn't anything new to you, and as we said at the, at the introduction, um, your program chair for humanities in DCU connected. So all of what you do is 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 pretty much online. Did you find the open teach experience much different to your to your normal teaching online, or was it an extension of it? Or um... it was very similar, Ken. Um, my my cohort. Well, the, the the modules I teach on at the moment have much smaller numbers. I mean, I, I've got about forty in in one of the modules I'm working on, and I also we also co teach a lot. Um, so I'm working with another um, online teacher together which works very well in live classes. Um, you know, it's very hard to do it on your own. Uh, monitor a chat box, set up activities, set up polls, and kind of keep everything going. So we started team teaching a long time ago. So we replicated that on, on Open Teach, and that's why we had four facilitators, um, Katrina, Sinead, and James. And that was a way to try and cope with the numbers. But we were also going for a very particular type of facilitation style, a kind of high touch facilitation style. Uh, And that involves, you know, if if you posted your introduction, you would get a reply from a facilitator. Um, And that is very hard to do at scale with 450 people. Um, But we we did do it uh, and it involves huge amount of work, uh, you know, by the facilitators. But I think it really was the right thing to do. Um, we started doing video replies because uh, I think Katrina was like, oh, geez, I'm getting tired of typing. I'll try out the video oh. thing in, in in loop in Moodle. And it worked really well. So we oh. all started in yeah. the second kind of week. We started doing videos because a short kind of one minute video feedback was quicker. Sure. But also the participants started coming back to us and telling us, oh, that was so lovely. It was so nice to hear your comments and so personal. And we were like, oh, you know, this is great. <laughs> We've hit on something here. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And that little inbuilt tool is really handy. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen it used um, not as much as I'd like to see it used. Um, so we, we run Moodle as well in, in WIT, as you know. I've seen it used there for uh, feedback on um, assignments and things like that. Um, but yeah, anyone who does it once says that they'll they'll do it again. But it's trying to get people to do it the first time is probably the is probably the challenge uh, with a lot of things. Uh, with a lot of things, I guess. People can feel a bit self conscious about videoing themselves. Uh, yeah, and, and I think once you get over the sound of your own voice, um, you're, you're probably halfway there. Um, mm. it, with, with, which yeah, um, if only I could do that this podcast would be so much better. Uh, <laughs> I, but also I, I think as well, people people think if it's a video, it has to be perfect. You know, it has to be like the BBC yeah. or whatever. Uh, but it doesn't, you know, quick and dirty is fine if that's appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, as you can tell, and, and as you can probably hear by some of the noise in the background, I have a, a new dog on one side of me. Not my new dog, I, I hasten to add. And noisy neighbors on the other side, so you could hear any kind of uh, background uh, noise. Uh, I think this. that's half the fun, though. I love seeing people's what's going on at the back of people's <laughs> houses and yeah, the, 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 the pets. Only, and yeah, well, the only thing I've done right um, in, in this setup at the moment, Orna, is that the camera is pointing at the wall behind me, so mm-hmm. no, nobody can come in. Well, I suppose they could climb in the window, but um, I, I've no blinds, interruption possible. Yeah, I have the blinds pulled down that way. Um, but if you see me staring off into the distance, it means that somebody. They are trying to catch my uh, trying try to catch my attention. So I suppose just in a similar vein to that, um, and I asked this question um, to to uh, another educator who teaches online, expecting a slightly different answer than I got. And it's not that there's I have no expectations about what the right or wrong answer is. Given the that everyone is learning online now. Um, 
has that had any impact on your traditional classes that you were teaching online anyway? Um, or has it been a case of that you've been able to, um, that, that you, yeah, you had a head start, I suppose, over everybody else? And... Yeah, so, yeah, we have an advantage. Most of, like pretty much 95% of our activity was already online. So for us, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge pivot. But what we did still have was campus-based exams. So sure. we've had to reimagine those. So there's, there's been a fair bit of work there. But to be honest, we don't we didn't have as many exams maybe you know i think i think in total it's eight or ten out of 32 okay. so in terms of scale it hasn't been too bad um and you know we're lucky we're, we're kind of good at using moodle and our students know how to use moodle and our tutors know how to use moodle so we're just kind of leveraging what we know already to make that happen so you know we're pretty confident about our our, our approach there um so no it hasn't been been a huge challenge that in that way for us but what has been a challenge is our students are typically part-time they're adults they're they're like you and me Ken the same kind of profile um and they have a lot of life load issues so they have family they have caring responsibilities they have work um but what what the situation has done is added to those life load sure. responsibilities uh, and everyone in a way is experiencing that um so you know, people are, people are experiencing, we are experienced, students are experiencing greater challenges and issues. Yeah. And um, we, we did things like give out blanket extensions on all assignments. Sure. Um, you know, uh, what we have done well, I think, is communicate well with the students. We've been very decisive about things and been very clear. And we've had a lot of kind of town hall type online meetings where people could ask whatever they wanted. Sure. And I think that's worked. Yeah, no, it's interesting you say that because um, it's, a, it's, it's a slight variation, but a lot of the same messages came across from, so the last person I spoke to on the podcast was a colleague of mine at WIT, Colin Dunphy, um, who teaches on our fully online higher diploma in science and computer science. Um, and I asked him pretty much the same question I just asked you, and, and his response was that the, the the issues that came up were um, not so much around the assessment side of it because their assessment would have all been continuous assessment, but uh, a lot of their students would have been students that either themselves directly, again, because they're part-time students, or people um, that they live with, um, or partners, um, were actually frontline staff. Um, so um, they had to modify the delivery uh, load, uh, and timing and um, stuff like that, and it sounds, you know, from 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 your answer that that they they were all the same sort of challenges, I guess that 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 you faced as well. Um, but yeah, so that, that 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 that's really interesting. So I suppose following on from that, I mean, the, what what do you think the um, output from all of this is going to be on a long term basis? I mean, what what what's your feel for how? education or online education um, has changed um, as a result of uh, as a result of this well like initially I was kind of excited that people were finally understanding what 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 I and my colleagues have known for a long time you know what's possible and it is possible to do good teaching online and I I, I was kind of enthusiastic about helping people and I've helped some colleagues and some family members who are teaching online and I enjoyed that uh, process but as we go on I wonder about the negative impacts Mark Brown um, who works with me put me onto some some more I suppose negative articles about the backlash that could be possible to get you know post online um, and one of the other things I've started thinking about was our students are well set up to learn online because they chose to. So they have, sure. you know, they have a laptop, they have a headset, they have the software they need. They've done it before. So they weren't learning for the first time. We've gone through lots of orientation with them over the years. So we have a whole program in place there that they, you know, they're well experienced, but a lot of other students don't have that. And, and really we're experiencing, you know, broadband issues shared laptops you know one laptop for three or four people all sure. trying to do learning learning on their phones which is fine but very hard to type an essay on your phone of course yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 
so I think the, the kind of digital divide stuff, the, the equity of, of access to technology, I've been thinking about that more um, and, and how it is a big divider. Yeah. Um, and I've been reading about, particularly for children <clears throat> um, uh, from a disadvantaged background, sure. you know, this no, is actually I, heightening those, those challenges. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, I, I suspect the whole thing happened so fast. I mean, literally, you know, you no more than myself went into work one Thursday morning thinking that, yeah, we're probably going to close next week uh, and then found out that, no, we we're actually closing that day. Yeah. Um, so, it, so it happened uh, phenomenally quickly. And, you know, look, I can bandy about the words like unprecedented and unbelievable and all those other um, adjectives to, to, to describe the situation. And it is all those things. Um, but what was never um, given much um, thought was, well, what about the people that don't have the tools? Um, and what about the people that live in, um, maybe it's not a, as much of an issue in Dublin, maybe it is, I don't know, but what about the people who live in very remote, uh, isolated uh, communities where um, broadband is a, is a major issue? I mean, the national broadband plan is still aspirational as opposed to reality. Uh, what about people that don't have the required tools? And as you said, yeah, you can probably consume materials on a phone but you certainly can't type uh, you certainly can't type an essay um and, and i suspect not just not just at higher level um but um at primary and secondary level and particularly for students that are still trying to figure out if there's going to be a leave insert or not mm-hmm. um it's it's a very very real issue um and and it is very strange uh, and very uncertain times that we that we live in and even just environmental factors like people having quiet space to study. Yeah. You know, if there's whole, a load of family members home at the same time and, you know, that kind of comes up in the literature about online student success, you know, it's in normal circumstances. Sure. But if someone doesn't have a quiet place and good time to study that, you know, that they're more likely not to succeed. So, you know, the, the coronavirus has heightened all the risk factors of Absolutely. learning online. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a, in a, and, and I also worry as well about all the universities are looking at alternative assessments and stuff. And some of them are very good, flexible ones like open book exams and stuff like that. But there's still some stuff like proctored, uh, you know, short exams. I mean, have they, you know, have they thought about, does someone even have the right laptop, sure. webcam, yeah. The, yeah, no. the bandwidth? I mean, I really worry about trying to do a, those type of assessments without thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and I think we, we've taken a fairly pragmatic approach to doing the, the trying to consider the student within reason that has the, 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 we're going for the lowest common denominator as opposed to trying to go to these very aspirational mm. um, ideas of, of, of online assessment. No, it's, it's, it certainly is an interesting time. And while no more than yourself, I was probably a little bit enthusiastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's online now, but then, yeah, this isn't really online. That's kind of you know because it doesn't have, you know, you, you outlined where you spent five months designing a two week course. Um, people didn't even have five hours to consider how they were going to complete out. Um, in our case, three or four weeks of, mm. of teaching plus plus assessment. So, um, it's 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 a I'd like to think, and I know, and, and certainly speaking from um, my experience of a lot of lecturers that I work with, people are doing wonderful work and are being very creative and are being very dedicated and are really being there for their students. But if, if we think this is online learning, then we don't really have a fully, un, fully uh, nuanced understanding of what online learning is. Mm. This, this is remote emergency teaching that is, is getting people over... Um, a hump, I guess, uh, in the road. Having said that, I do think that I, I like to think sli- slightly positively in that um, I would like to think that it's opening up people to using tools and technologies that they mightn't have or might have been afraid to use before. Um, and perhaps they'll find that that wasn't as scary as they thought it was going to be. Um, and it was actually better than they anticipated it was going to be as well. So I, I, I suppose being a glass half full person, I'd like to think that the, the, there might be some positivity, um, if, it, if only in those two sort of uh, small areas. I'm conscious that I've taken up loads and loads of your time. Um, 
and you've been absolutely fantastic and shared some fabulous insights um, around the, the, the Open Teach course. Uh, and I'll certainly encourage anybody who's listening to check it out uh, the next time it uh, runs and uh, check out the openteach.ie um, website. All that's left for me to say is thank you very, very much, Dr. Orla Farrell. You've been an absolute star. It's been, as always, it's um, an education to talk to you. Um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's been great. Thanks very, very much. Uh, thanks, Ken. And thanks for the invitation. I am delighted to be part of Who's Zooming Who with, with a very <laughs> catchy title as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's already the title. Um, it's mostly just me. Uh, but but look, you've been, you've been great. It's Aretha Franklin, isn't it? It was Aretha Franklin. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it, it was um, it was a hit in 1985 between uh, Free Way of Love and Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves. So it's uh, kind of got kind of lost in the middle there. But I thought, seeing as the whole world is using Zoom, that uh, who Zooming who seemed like uh, see, it was either play that, on words. Yeah, it was either that or or, or, or Fat Larry's band and um, Aretha Franklin is 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 always better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, thanks, Ken. Thanks a million. All the best. Cheers. Cheers.